On August 17, 1943, the U-511, helmed by Captain Lieutenant Fritz Schneewind, was handed over to the Japanese in Kure. Petty Officer Fleinz Reise, one of the original German crew members, maintained a diary that provided insights into the life of the 49 German submariners on board. After the handover, the German crew enjoyed a monitored 10-day vacation near Mount Fuji. During this break, Reise encountered German families who had been relocated from the East Indies after its occupation by Japan in 1942. These relatives were forcibly parted from their spouses and fathers, and lived in fear for their own well-being as well as that of their children. Upon concluding their leave, the former U-511 sailors were relocated to Yokohama. Here they were instructed by the German naval attaché to head to Kobe and embark on the German ship Osorno, destined for Singapore. Intriguingly, they set sail on September 2nd, just one day before Italy's armistice went into effect. This led Japan to seize all Italian ships in the Far East, including three submarines that had been serving as cargo vessels from occupied France. Without adequate crew to man them, Japan offered the submarines to Germany. The senior German naval officer in Singapore agreed, anticipating the arrival of the XU-511 crew. The subs were renamed, Capellini became UIT-24, Giuliani was rebranded as UIT-23, and Torelli was redesignated UIT-25. The group of 49 German submariners was insufficient to operate three large transport submarines. Previously under Italian command, these subs needed between 54 and 58 crew members. Even when used as cargo ships, a minimum of 35 crew was deemed safe. To address the crew deficit, the Japanese allowed the Germans to recruit from interned Italian sailors. Influenced likely under coercion by Japanese guards, several Italians agreed to serve Germany. These new recruits, combined with German civilian volunteers in Singapore, filled the remaining crew gaps, while XU-511 personnel occupied all commissioned, warrant, and petty officer roles. Heinz Reise was appointed to UIT-24 and temporarily promoted to warrant machinist. Among the three former Italian submarines, Reise likely thought that UIT-24 had the slimmest chance of safely returning to France. With a medium cruising speed of 9.4 knots, its designed range was a mere 7,500 miles on the surface, necessitating at least one refueling stop between Singapore and western France. UIT-25 would also require refueling, while only UIT-23 could potentially complete the journey without it. During the autumn and into January 1944, the Germans worked diligently to train their volunteers into effective submarine crews. By mid-January, the submariners had purchased Japanese gifts for loved ones back in Germany and sent them via a German merchant ship headed for Bordeaux. News of the loss of blockade-running ships and U-boats raised concerns about what awaited them in the South Atlantic. The transfer of gifts to the freighter was officially due to limited space on the UITs but also served as a cautious hedge. Race's packages incidentally arrived safely. Towards the end of January, the three ex-Italian U-boats were stocked and fueled. It is presumed, certainly in the case of UIT-24, that none of them were armed with torpedoes, as all available space was reserved for cargo. UIT-24 loaded quinine in Singapore as partial cargo. On February 2nd, she set sail for Penang to load rubber. She left Penang on February 8th, aiming to refuel from the German tanker Charlotte Schliemann en route. Despite the known risks posed by Allied naval forces, morale among the German and Italian crews remained high. Rituals for first-time equator crossings known as Father Neptune ceremonies were held. Weather conditions eventually deteriorated, causing damage to the UIT-24's wooden deck and radio antenna. By February 26, concern was mounting over the whereabouts of Charlotte Schliemann. After a relayed message to the Kriegsmarine, they received alarming news the tanker had been destroyed in an air attack. Their last option was to meet up with the break, the only remaining German tanker in the Indian Ocean. Yet, as they were heading toward the break, news arrived that this tanker too had been sunk. With fuel dangerously low, a sense of impending doom began to fill the cramped interior of the UIT-24. Updated orders rerouted them southwest towards the Cape of Good Hope to rendezvous with the eastbound U-532, carrying fuel sufficient for a return to Penang. Hopes of reaching home shattered, 
Lieutenant Tals, the commanding officer, steered the U-boat toward the meeting point. Engineers alternated between electric and diesel propulsion to maximize the scant diesel reserves. On March 18th, UIT-24 and U-532 spotted each other. RASA prepared canvas hoses for the fuel transfer, but the operation faced obstacles. Sharks swarmed between the submarines, posing a risk to the hoses flapping in the rough sea. Machine guns were used to deter the sharks, diverting their attention to their injured peers instead of the hoses. Despite worsening weather causing hose ruptures, 40 tons of fuel eventually were transferred to UIT-24. Both submarines then set their course for Penang, with U-532 briefly breaking off to sink a 2,281-ton freighter. They safely arrived in Penang on April 3rd. Two days afterward, UIT-24 embarked on a journey from Penang to Singapore. By this stage of the war, British submarines heavily patrolled Malay's coastal waters. Raisa described the trip. Only one engineer stayed below. The rest remained on deck with life vests on. When crossing the shallow seabed off Malay, they opted for daytime navigation, reasoning that torpedoes would be more easily spotted. At night, the U-boats typically anchored near mangroves. Racer recalled spending the first night near a jungle-covered island, visited by local inhabitants. This brief respite was the only pleasant aspect of an otherwise perilous journey. On the second day, a torpedo targeted them but was narrowly dodged. The sense of impending catastrophe lingered until they reached the relative safety of Singapore's harbor. During the voyage, Raisa had commented in the wardroom that the war seemed unwinnable. The U-boat's executive officer, George Hoyce, took offense and labeled Raisa a defeatist, even threatening court-martial. The issue eventually subsided, and no court-martial took place. Reflecting years later, Raisa noted that Hoyce was a strong party loyalist, struggling with the idea that the promised 1,000-year Reich might collapse early. Despite the grim odds, morale remained notably high, especially among the former U-511 crew. Raisa attributed this to the strong discipline instilled by the Kriegsmarine. A radio message received in Singapore disclosed the status of UIT-25, which had been drifting off Java due to mechanical failure but eventually made it back to port. The UIT-23 wasn't as fortunate. It was torpedoed by the British submarine HMS Tally Ho shortly after departing Singapore. Returning to Europe now seemed implausible for the remaining UITs. Instead, pushed by the Japanese, they were to serve as transport vessels between Singapore and Japan. Given their slow diving capabilities and the Allied blockade, their best utility was as cargo submarines. The arrangement also addressed the growing concern over Europeans in Japan, who were viewed as a burden unless they contributed to Japan's war effort. Consequently, the UITs would carry food northward for these Europeans and military supplies southward for the Japanese. On May 25, 1944, UIT-24 embarked on its first northward journey. Two days later, it narrowly evaded detection by two surfaced U.S. submarines, thanks to inattentive American lookouts and sonarmen. Rayson noted in his diary, Japan appears to be under complete U.S. blockade. On June 5, while submerged, they spotted another U.S. submarine on the surface but again went unnoticed. By June 6, the UIT-24 had navigated through the outer minefields and docked at Kobe, Japan. The U-boat then underwent refitting in a Japanese shipyard. On July 20th, the UIT-25, initially slated to tail closely behind UIT-24, reached Japan after a harrowing journey. Suffering mechanical failures near Singapore, she was diverted to Surabaya, which lacked the facilities for long-term repairs. She then had to proceed to Kobe, largely on the surface, making her successful voyage given the intense U.S. Navy surveillance almost miraculous in hindsight. After a brief layover, the UIT-24 resumed its cargo runs, transporting goods from Japan to Singapore as per the agreement. Again, the Germans dodged U.S. submarines and arrived in an increasingly isolated Singapore on September 19, 1944. Maritime communication was almost non-existent. Even trivial items like aspirin had inflated prices. The crew of the UIT-24 found life quite lucrative in Singapore, at least from the perspective of some younger and less cautious submariners. Setting out from Singapore on September 28, the UIT-24 navigated the perilous route to Penang, known now as the racetrack, due to its high-risk nature. Once stocked with food at Penang, 
It returned to Singapore and began another northward journey to Japan, arriving safely. The trips were shrouded in utmost secrecy. Crew members wore civilian clothes ashore and avoided discussing their missions, unaware that U.S. intelligence had cracked the German Enigma code and was tracking their every move. After Germany's surrender, both the UIT-24 and UIT-25 were handed over to the Japanese but never operationally used. Renumbered as I-503 and I-504, they remained in Kobe at war's end. Heinz Reisa and fellow crewmen lived in relative comfort, funded partly by Japan's payments for the successful cargo runs. Keeping a low profile, they chose to minimize interactions with the Japanese due to increasing racial tensions heightened by U.S. air raids. Upon Japan's surrender, the former submariners dispersed. Some worked for the U.S. occupation forces until they could return home. Reisi operated a small power station for the U.S. Army near Kobe and was repatriated to Germany in 1947. Later, he and his wife moved to the United States and became citizens. Until his retirement, Reisi ran a service station in upstate New York. Constructed at Deutsch Werft's Hamburg shipyards, the U-511 was a Type 9C U-boat with a 1,120-ton surface displacement, engineered for extended missions up to 13,450 miles. After her commissioning and preliminary voyages, she embarked on her inaugural war patrol from July to August 1942, under the leadership of Captain Lieutenant Friedrich Steinhoff. Deployed to the Caribbean, she sank the British San Fabian and the Dutch Rotterdam on August 27th. That same day, the U-511 severely damaged the standard oil vessel Esso Aruba before charting a course for Lorient, France via the Guadeloupe Passage. The U-boat's next patrol was under the command of Captain Lieutenant Fritz Schneewind. On January 9, 1943, northwest of Africa, she sank a British cargo ship before switching to monitoring Allied operations in North Africa. Upon return to Lorient, Schneewind was briefed that the U-511 was to undergo modifications before being transferred to the Japanese in the Far East. This wasn't unexpected, as the Germans were known to operate U-boats out of locations like Singapore, Penang, Sumatra, and Java, and even had a small naval detachment in Kobe, Japan. The aim was to improve waning German-Japanese relations. The Japanese Navy was particularly eager to acquire the Type 9C U-boat, which outclassed their own subs that were cumbersome and slow to dive, making them vulnerable to aerial attacks. Blueprints for the U-511 had already been sent to Japan for evaluation and eventual production, with the U-511 intended to serve as both a prototype and a training vessel. As Schneewin navigated the U-511 southwards from the Bay of Biscay towards the Cape of Good Hope, he was under strict orders to evade all contact with Allied vessels to prevent detection, as the delivery was the mission's primary objective. However, once in the less patrolled waters of the Indian Ocean, the U-511 was authorized to engage targets as long as they were directly along its route. Accordingly, on June 27, the U-boat sank the American Liberty ship Sebastiano Cermano, followed by an attack on another freighter 12 days later. Upon the U-511's arrival in Penang, its crew received VIP treatment, a courtesy extended by the Japanese Navy that was not the norm. Crews from other German U-boats operating in East Asian ports often faced bureaucratic hurdles and even direct antagonism. Instances of verbal abuse against German sailors were common, and one extreme case in Singapore saw a German seaman hung by his heels, although still alive outside the dockyard. Such behavior was likely driven by Japanese propaganda promoting animosity toward Westerners. In early August, the crew piloted the U-511 to Japan, and again, they were treated with exceptional hospitality upon docking at Cure. The official handover ceremony occurred on August 17, 1943. Interestingly, after its formal transfer to the Japanese Navy, the U-511 never returned to operational status. Furthermore, the Japanese never initiated production of the Type 9C U-boat. Conventional wisdom suggests that material shortages and the absence of adequate shipyard facilities were likely factors in the cancellation of these plans, although Japanese records remain conspicuously silent on the subject. 